Kennedy from Princeton, um, who's going to be talking to us about dark matter. Um, so Professor Alessanti is a, an expert in uh, all things beyond the standard model, a wide variety of topics. Uh, her focus of late has been on dark matter, which is what you will hear. Uh, she was an undergraduate at uh, Harvard. She got graduated summa cum laude and went to Stanford. She came to Princeton as a PCTS fellow, and they were smart enough to keep her. And she's been uh, faculty there since 2013. Um, usually, I wouldn't talk about when you talk about uh, awards people received. Usually, you don't go back to you know what they got in eighth grade. But uh, she was a winner of the uh, Intel Science Talent Search, which was previously the Westinghouse Talent Search. Um, more recently, the faculty, she's been recipient of uh, Sloan and Cottrell Fellowships. Um, so work-wise, uh, when she was a graduate student, a lot of her work focused more on um, collider physics and things related to collider physics. Uh, she was one of the early uh, originators of the idea of things we now call simplified models, which is how people think about collider physics and really actually do a lot of collider studies these days. Uh, but she also did work on dark matter. <coughs> now, dark matter is a broad topic. There are all sorts of approaches people take, underground detectors, space-based detectors, collider searches, uh, and uh, Professor Lasanti has uh, uh, had important work on all these things. And she's currently actively involved in a number of efforts and new ideas to look for dark matter, including the Ptolemy experiment, which is an effort to look for uh, relic neutrinos, so that's the cosmic relic neutrino background. Um, and uh, recently, she helped uh, solve the origin of uh, just as a side note, uh, a huge excess of, of gamma rays coming from the galactic center, uh, and she and her collaborators helped us understand uh, what that was. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of the breadth of uh, what she works on, I picked four sequential papers that she wrote in uh, 2017, just so you can see, and, uh, and just to tell you the titles. And they are Large Hadron Collider Searches for Dark Sector Showers, okay, so LHC Physics, the metal pore stellar halo in rave T gas and its implications for the velocity distribution of dark matter, so using astronomical surveys to, to, to do physics. Uh, searches for dark matter annihilation in galaxy groups, so gamma ray astronomy, and direct detection of sub MEV dark matter with three dimensional Dirac materials, for which I had to ask her what actually Dirac materials were. Uh, but anyway, my point is that she's worked on a, a, a wide array of subjects. She's going to tell us about just one tiny fraction of it today, uh, so uh, looking forward to it. Thank you, Neil. Um, it's a, a great pleasure to uh, to be up here. I've traveled all the way up on New Jersey Transit. Um, no, but I always love coming up to NYU to, to visit. Um, so as, as Neil said, I'll talk a little bit about some recent work that uh, my group has been doing um, using the Gaia data to try to understand something about the distribution of dark matter in the galaxy. And um, I'm opening here with a photograph, not taken by myself, unfortunately. I wish I could take photographs like this. Um, but it's a photograph of the night sky um, above New Zealand. Uh, and I love pictures like this because you can, you know, you get these images of the Milky Way and you can see all of this beautiful structure that's there in the sky. And, um, you know, the main subject of, of my, of the, you know, next hour is going to be how can we actually use um, information from the, the stars that we see out in our Milky Way galaxy to say something about um, one of the most uh, uh, biggest open questions that we have in, in physics. So traditionally, uh, the dynamics of stars in our galaxy have played a really important role in uh, inferring the presence of dark matter. Um, and this is going back to the work of uh, Vera Rubin and Ford in the 1970s and the measurement of uh, galactic rotation curves. So this is you know, the canonical uh, piece of evidence that people always cite um, in support for dark matter. Uh, the basic idea is that you measure the rotation of gas or stars um, as a function of distance from the center of a galaxy. And um, you know, there would be expectation from Newtonian gravity, which is shown here in yellow, and then the observation, which is shown in red. And the discrepancy between the two is the anomaly that we want to be able to explain. And the, there are two primary ways in which you can um, explain why the observed accelerations are larger than what you'd expect. Uh, the first is, well, we need to go back and modify gravity. Maybe Newton was wrong. And uh, you know, the, the error is actually in this theory prediction here. The second way that we can explain this 
is by saying that Newton was correct, but there's actually a lot more mass there than we would otherwise see, and so the correction comes into play essentially in the M term uh, in, in that equation. So the modified gravity hypothesis uh, has been around for a while. Um, it's challenging to explain it in the context of uh, full cosmological theory, so it's one of the primary ch challenges against it. Um, very recently, uh, my group has been going back and just kind of revisiting these ideas and trying to understand uh, what they mean in light of just the dynamics of our own galaxy. And actually what we're finding is that there's a much simpler explanation for why these, uh, this doesn't really work, um, and it just sort of kind of cuts at the heart of these theories. And the idea is as follows. So if we have um, an observation here of some object in the galaxy and it has some radial acceleration, what we observe with circular rotation curves is that the acceleration needs to be larger than what we predict from Newton's gravity. Um, but it turns out that if you modify uh, any, any gravity model to sort of boost your radial acceleration in this direction, you simultaneously boost the acceleration of the object in the vertical direction. And that's something we could go out and look for. Um, and we've been going back through some um, data from Sloan, trying to see if there's a consistent way in which we can explain both the rotation curves as well as the vertical acceleration of stars in this modified gravity framework. And it turns out it's really hard. Um, it's actually uh, uh, these, these modified gravity theories are quite constrained um, when you take into account both the radial acceleration of objects in our galaxy as well as their vertical accelerations. Yeah? So does this oscillate up and down or something? Yeah, so okay. um, yeah, it, it, motions of most of these stars will be kind of going like this in and out of the plane. Yeah. But it, it, they're actually measured quite well, like even just going back to, to Sloan data. And so it's, um, uh, it's, it's actually quite predictive. So if, if we're not going to modify gravity, then the next option is that we add more matter to the system. Um, and if we assume that this matter is dark because we haven't seen it, and that it interacts very weakly, then that means that uh, the dark matter is going to form not a disk, like the visible matter, but some cloud-like halo uh, around the disk. Um, and if we want to be able to reproduce the observation of a flat rotation curve, that tells us something about how the mass of this halo must scale with distance. Uh, it scales roughly linearly with distance. Um, and its overall size is huge relative to the visible part of our galaxy. So in particular, its mass is about, total mass, is about 10 times uh, as large as the visible part. Uh, its radius is about 10 times as long. And we can do a back of the envelope estimate just using the virial theorem uh, to estimate on average what the speeds are of the particles in this halo. And it comes out to about 200 kilometers a second. So to first order, you can think of this halo as being a massive gas cloud of dark matter particles that are zipping around uh, at fairly sl slow speeds, at least on astronomical scales. Um, so the way this impacts us here on Earth is uh, you know, we are flying through and rotating around the center of our galaxy. We are passing through this halo. So a lot of these dark matter particles are streaming through us now as we speak. We just don't notice because they're interacting so weakly. Um, but we want to try to take advantage of this, so we build experiments um, that, uh, you know, put maybe deep underground in a mine or underneath a mountain, um, and we just kind of wait, hoping that some particle, some dark matter particle in this halo will finally make its way through, hit something in the detector, and then leave a signal that would tell us uh, that that event actually occurred. Um, and, uh, you know, these, because as I said, the dark matter is non-relativistic, these kinds of interactions actually just boil down to sort of the standard scattering interactions we teach in freshman physics. So, you know, you have some dark matter particle comes in with a momentum, hits a nucleus at rest. Um, the dark matter recoils, um, but you don't see it because it's dark. Uh, what you see is the nucleus that bounces off um, with some recoil energy from that interaction. Uh, when calculating the rates for these kinds of, um, these kinds of events, uh, the rate is going to depend both on the particle physics properties of the dark matter uh, and also on its distribution in the galaxy or in the halo. So in particular, information about the local dark matter density, so its number density, as well as its speeds, all feed into the rate of these kinds of interactions. Uh, so that motivates needing to actually build a model 
for this massive cloud of dark matter that's surrounding um, the Milky Way. So this was noted very early on um, after the discovery of flat rotation curves, starting with the work of Oshweiker and Hebold in 1974. And um, the, the sort of model that came into place in the 1970s and 1980s has been um, the one that's been used, uh, sort of become canonical, and the one that's been used since then. And uh, let me talk a little bit about the ingredients that go into this, this model. So the idea is you, you treat the dark matter as some collisionless fluid with some phase space density, so call it f of xp. Uh, you assume that uh, the fluid mass is conserved, and then you add in some additional assumptions. So for example, you assume that the fluid is in steady state, that uh, its velocities are isotropic, and that you can reproduce the flat rotation curves, which is the observations. And combining these two things spits out uh, a prediction for the density of the dark matter, um, and it's essentially just an isothermal density, so it, it goes as one over r squared, and uh, the corresponding velocity distribution of the dark matter is then just a simple Maxwell-Boltzmann. So in this simple framework, um, actually it's not too far off to think again of this halo as just being an isothermal gas of dark matter particles. And um, like I said, this has become just sort of the standard formalism that's been used um, ever since these initial papers. And so every kind of uh, um, limit or result from any direct detection experiment essentially is assuming this particular model for how the dark matter is distributed uh, near, near the sun's position. But what I want to do in the talk today is actually go back and start questioning some of these assumptions and evaluate whether or not they're reasonable ones to be making. Um, and this is kind of an opportune time to be doing that in light of some recent data that will, will really allow us to kind of go back and, um, and answer some of these questions quite definitively. So in particular, let's go back and uh, consider this steady state assumption. So what does it actually mean if we assume that the dark matter halo in the Milky Way is in steady state? Well, in order to do this, we want to kind of think of our Milky Way as having some family tree, and we want to understand how our galaxy got to where it is today. Um, in particular, so in the, in the lambda cold dark matter framework, uh, as a galaxy builds up over time, um, it does so via the mergers of smaller galaxies. So our halo grew to the size it is today by essentially eating up other galaxies over time. So in the particular example where maybe our history is fairly quiet, the last such of these mergers happened a very long time ago. Um, so at that point in time, our like, proto-galaxy, our proto-Milky Way ate some other large galaxy, and then the system essentially just sat unperturbed for a really long period of time um, until it's the galaxy we see today and that we're living in. We can contrast this particular um, scenario with another one where the merger history is a lot more complicated. So imagine the case where a lot of these smaller satellite galaxies were eaten up in the process of building up our own galaxy. And amazingly, we actually, uh, up until recently, didn't really have a lot of inputs as to which of these two scenarios were the ones, um, you know, were actually truth for, for our own galaxy. Um, however, you know, whether or not this is reality or that one um, has a large effect on how we model the dark matter. So in particular, that steady state assumption that's at the heart of um, the typical model for the Milky Way halo it would be consistent with this kind of picture, but would not be consistent with this one where the system is sort of constantly evolving from these, from these mergers. So this tells us that actually in order to be able to make more precise predictions about dark matter in the Milky Way, and also for what the expectation is in experiments, we actually need to understand something about the evolution of our galaxy um, on larger cosmological scales. <coughs> and so just to kind of highlight this point um, in a bit more detail, um, two separate kinds of histories, so in those two scenarios I outlined on the previous slide, can lead, for example, to two different distributions of dark matter speeds um, near the sun. And when we come to this kind of simple scattering picture, there are certain scenarios where you actually need some minimum, the dark matter needs some minimum speed in order to give the nucleus enough of a kick to be able to actually see the event. And so it could turn out that if in certain scenarios where you had a particular um, history that sort of suppressed 
um, high speed dark matter particles locally, you might actually just not be able to see that kind of dark matter particle in an experiment. Versus in a separate case, so for example here in history A, you could end up having much higher scattering rates that would allow you to actually see, see the event. So this is just to emphasize this link between understanding something about the cosmological history, the growth of our galaxy, um, and, and its impact on actually whether or not we can see something having to do with the, the interactions of the dark matter and experiment on, on Earth. What's, what's like the Earth's orbital velocity? The Earth's what? The Earth's orbital velocity. Uh, around the sun? Yeah. On the order of like 30 kilometers a second. And then the speed the sun is moving? Like around it. 220 kilometers a second. So I mean, those are numbers comparable to 200. Uh, right? so yes. Since yes. the thermal velocity of the dark matter, um, I mean, you would, in order for that to be the, the thing <coughs> that, that <coughs> prevents you from seeing something, you would need for the matter to be co-moving with the sun or the earth, right? Um, no, so it can actually be uh, sort of small differences on what's going on in the tails of these distributions that can already be important enough to give you some kind of observable effect. Yeah, so I mean, in a more drastic scenario like the one you were suggesting, then um, you're saying like these two peaks would be in dramatically different locations or something like that. Well, I'm saying is don't you have to add like speed of the sun to the... To the oh, I mean, for this particular example, you can, I mean, well, this is just a cartoon, but it's essentially factored in. That's accounted for. So I'm talking about sort of smaller differences in what's going on like on this, on this side. But that's already enough to actually create an observable effect. Can you say something about the history of our galaxy by the fact that, by the morphology, the fact that it's a spiral of galaxy and not the deep? <clears throat> yeah, so, and um, you, you can make assumptions about, uh, you know, it, it's, you, you can guess that it's probably pretty quiet. Um, uh, also, um, just from simulations and trying to reconstruct galaxies that look similar to our own, it looks like you need a fairly quiet um, merger history in order to make that work. Um, my point is, though, that with the new data that we're getting from Gaia, um, all of that's going to become very concrete, or more concrete. Um, excellent. All right, so um, with that introduction, um, what I want to do in the rest of the talk is actually start off by explaining in some more detail the expect, you know, exactly how a galaxy like the Milky Way builds up and what is happening to the dark matter in that process. And that's going to give us sort of a, a theory formalism and an, a set of expectations for what we, um, what we should expect. Um, and then with that, we'll have enough tools in our, in our toolbox to be able to start going into data from Gaia un and understand what its implications are for, for building um, a more detailed map of the dark matter in the Milky Way. Uh, but let's start off by just understanding this process, breaking down this process by which a galaxy like the Milky Way would form. Um, over, over uh, starting from very early <coughs> redshifts. So for this kind of, um, you know, for this kind of work, we need to rely a lot on simulations. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to be showing you results from the FIRE simulations, where FIRE stands for Feedback in Realistic <coughs> Environments. Um, and this is uh, you know, work that we've been doing in collaboration with Phil Hopkins's group at Caltech. Uh, these simulations are some of the highest resolution simulations um, at the moment uh, for Milky Way-like galaxies, and they trace the gas, stars, and dark matter from very early redshifts, so in this case, like redshift 10, all the way up until today. So I'm gonna show you a movie um, for one of the galaxies that we've been, simulated galaxies that we've been studying, and it starts at redshift 10. The movie is just the stars, but do keep in mind that the simulation is also keeping track of all of the dark matter, it's just not being shown. So this is at very early times. The Milky Way, or the simulated Milky Way, is going to be centered around here. And you can see that it grows uh, as a function of time um, as these bright clumps, which are smaller galaxies, fall in and then get completely disrupted. So I'll just play that again. Um, <coughs> so initially, there's sort of very large variations um, as the galaxy is sort of coming into place. Um, the system kind of seems to settle down a little bit with time, but you still continue to get these, these mergers that, that are happening. Um, but when you see movies like this, um, it gets sort of a reminder about just how dynamic the system is um, and uh, how rich the history of our own galaxy could, could possibly be. Um, so working with these kinds of simulations is fortuitous because they, they tell us where the dark matter is, and that's a problem we, you know, 
We can't do that in our own galaxy. So we can work with these systems and actually understand a lot of general principles about what should be happening to the dark matter in these processes that will then help us to make inferences about our own galaxies. So what I want to do is essentially break down that movie now as a function of time. So starting from the really old processes and then moving to the more recent ones. Um, when the very old halo forms, um, so this is sort of the initial stages of that, uh, of that movie, uh, the, the gravitational potential of that galaxy is changing a lot. Um, and the changes in the gravitational potential essentially redistribute the energy of the dark matter and the stars from those early mergers, and it mixes them up in phase space. Um, so the, the fact that you can have that this is happening is very important because it's essentially the thing that just sort of shakes everything up in this early universe and makes everything just redistributes them in energy and makes them all kind of look the same. Um, we can go into the simulation and pull out all of the dark matter and stars that we see today um, that we know came from these, came in at these really early times, and we can just see what they look like in the simulated halo today. Um, and this is just a, a plot of their three components of velocities. Um, the dark matter is shown in black, and the red shows the stars. Again, these are their velocities today. But because this, in this, this is in a simulation, we know their history, we know that these are all of the dark matter and stars that came in really early. Um, and so as you can see by eye, the two lines are almost identical. They trace each other really well. Um, this correspondence is not trivial. Um, it's actually kind of surprising that this should even work. And um, I, I think what's happening here is primarily that this is all coming, this is all material that came in so early. Um, when the galaxy's potential was changing, that it's just essentially has gotten all mixed up to the point where you can no longer essentially distinguish between the dark matter and the stars. Um, however, the fact that the two do line on top of each other is extremely promising because it starts giving us some hope that maybe we can actually use stars today as a way of telling us what's going on with the underlying dark matter distribution. Um, in, these, in these models, uh, <coughs> dark matter as well as uh, stars are interacting gravitationally. Yes. So what is the distinction? Is there any other? Um, the, yeah, that's a good star, point. So stars have uh, different forces, but star particles have some different interactions which they don't share with the dark matter? So in, they distinguish? Yeah, so these are um, simulations that assume um, whole dark matter. So the dark matter is essentially collisionless other than its gravitational interactions. And that's um, roughly true as well for the stars. Uh, what's different about the stars in the simulation is that they're allowed to be born at, as a function of time. So in, whenever there's a, a region of really dense gas in the simulation, the star, like a star particle can be born. Particle, because that's what they call it. And um, a star clump can be born in Really from gravitational interaction. Um, or or no, I mean, just because you would expect that the stars. There, there is. Uh, yeah, some collapse of uh, in, in some really dense uh, stel uh, gas region. Um, and so, I mean, at, in the simulation, that's just, it sort of, you know, it pops up, right? There's just something that's like, if you have a dense region that's, you know, denser than this, you know, put a star particle there. Um, but in reality, that's just because you end up having some collapse of the, the dense region that ends up forming the star. Yeah, so, so the, the simulation can birth these star particles, but cannot birth dark matter particles. So that would be one, one big difference. <clears throat> um, okay, so once the, the main, uh, the proto-galaxy is sort of in place, um, these mergers are going to continue, um, but at this point in time, um, because the potential of the Milky Way doesn't really change very much with each new galaxy that falls in, um, the energy is essentially going to be conserved for any of the material that's coming off of that, that galaxy. So. Um, Let's consider the case where we have one of these small satellites and it's falling in. Um, it's going to experience these tidal forces from the, um, the strong gravitational pull of the Milky Way. And those tidal forces essentially are going to start removing dark matter and stars from that satellite. Um, and if we were to take a snapshot, some photograph of this, almost immediately after this process starts, we find that those d dark matter and stars essentially kind of trace out the path that the satellite galaxy took as it was falling in. So these kinds of um, features are referred to as streams. 
And we've definitely observed them, um, especially uh, in, in the stellar halo. So the most well-studied example comes from um, the Sagittarius stream, which is uh, one of these streams that's forming from the Sagittarius galaxy that's falling in as we speak. So this is just a simulation of what this looks like, a model of this, the Sagittarius galaxy falling in. It's getting shredded apart, and it leaves stars in its path. And this is right about where we're seeing it today. So um, it's made several orbits, and we can actually reconstruct, uh, roughly reconstruct the path based off of the stars that have gotten left behind as it's been falling in. Uh, and here's um, a separate simulation showing what happens to the dark matter in the same, um, same process as Sagittarius falls in and is getting torn apart. Now, this is all ongoing now. Um, like I said, Sagittarius hasn't been fully disrupted yet, uh, but it will be because it's just in the process of getting eaten up and, and digested by our own galaxy. Uh, so, um, as time evolves, uh, we end up getting very different kinds of features that can arise. So, for example, if we had this galaxy fall in and it's made lots of different orbits, um, what ends up happening is that all of the material that's gotten removed kind of gets mixed up spatially. So you can no longer make out individual paths of these orbits. Um, and so it, it uh, spatially doesn't really look very... Uh, um, I don't know what the very distinctive, right? I mean, one of the things that's really amazing about stellar streams is like you can actually make out the whole path that the satellite took as it was falling in. And you lose that kind of information in this case. Um, however, because energy is conserved in this process, you still end up getting interesting features in the velocity of this material. Um, and we see this in simulations. So this is work from a few years ago that was using a dark matter only simulation. Um, if we looked at for example, the dark matter in the simulated Milky Way, um, it looked pretty bland and pretty ordinary. But if we then looked at the dark matter in velocity space, um, it actually still had these like interesting clusters and um, distinctive kind of behavior to it. Um, this is results from a dark matter only simulation, because um, that was pretty much the state of the art in like 2010. And uh, now with fire, we can go in, because this has dark matter and stars, and see what's happening um, in these kinds of cases. Um, so I'm going to show a movie where we take the, this is in the fire simulation, so where you have both stars and dark matter particles. That's where they are today. Um, we start off with, uh, we're only focusing on the, the stars and dark matter that are roughly located at the same distance as the sun from the center of the galaxy. And we have all of their information as to where they originated from. So we can trace their trajectories back in time. So I'm going to run the clock backwards now. So this is starting at redshift zero. I can run the clock backwards. And you can see that initially, sort of not too long ago, both the dark matter and the stars are kind of in this fuzzy cloud. There really isn't any interesting structure to it. But as the clock winds further and further backward, you'll see that it actually starts looking much more coherent. Um, so this is when everything was in the form of a stream. And what's, that coherence is going to become much more sharply defined until we actually get everything's going to just sort of snap back to the original galaxy right about now? No. There it is. So that's how it started. So it started like that, ended up looking like a stream, became this big amorphous cloud, and that's where we're seeing it today. Um, and uh, what's pretty striking in that movie is that both the dark matter and the stars um, are kind of following each other. Uh, the features are, are roughly similar. So we can, you know, even if we look at the velocities of them today, again, they're, they're almost, uh, they track each other very, very quickly. Um, so there's uh, two main takeaway points from this first part of the, the talk. The first is that the mergers that build up the Milky Way galaxy leave an imprint in a wealth of spatial and velocity structures. And you can take advantage of that in terms of um, inferring properties of how our galaxy came to be where it is today. And then the second takeaway is that in many of these instances, the stars um, actually act as really good visible tracers for the dark matter. So if you can go in and actually see what the stars, how the stars are behaving today, you can make inferences about what the dark matter is doing in, in our halo and actually build a map for the dark matter in the Milky Way. 
Um, so with that, uh, with that theory foundation, we can now move to looking at the data. Because um, that motivates going into data and actually studying, um, um, study the, studying the positions and velocities of stars uh, near the solar position. Uh, so the data set that I'll be focusing on is one from Gaia. Um, and uh, so the, the Gaia mission is um, extremely exciting uh, because it's for the first time going to be providing um, a snapshot of about a billion stars in the Milky Way, which is about 1% of all of the stars. Um, this is the follow-up astrometric survey to Hipparchos, which occurred in the early 1990s. Um, and it's just a huge improvement relative to uh, the data that we had back then. So Gaia was launched in December 2013, and the second data release occurred earlier this year, so just in April 2018. To give you a sense for how the data from Gaia compares to what we had from Hipparchos, um, let me show you this image here. So now the galactic disk is rotated 90 degrees, so it's just pointing upwards. Here's the sun, and then the center of the galaxy is here. Um, this small little dash circle around the sun was the region where Hipparchos had really good measurements of distances. And now this big dashed region out here is how far out Gaia has about comparable measure, uh, sensitivity to the distances of the stars. So you can see just the enormity of the, just the, the change in the, the scale there. Um, so for you know, an effort where you want to try to reconstruct the merger history of the Milky Way, it turns out that most of the stars that Gaia sees um, are not actually too helpful, because the vast majority of the stars are the ones that were born in the Milky Way and are in the disk. And what one would want to pull out in order to reconstruct the merger history of the galaxy are the very rare stars that were dragged in from these mergers. And so that task is one that's um, similar to what one would do if you were going to go out and look for fossils. Um, so as a fossil hunter, you'd go out, maybe find something that looks like this, and then based off of the shape of that fossil, um, you'd want to try to infer something about the creature that it originated from. Um, maybe based off of the location where you found the fossil, or maybe using like radioactive dating, you could also make some inferences about the time that that creature roamed the Earth. And so based off of these clues, you then would make some inference based off of this fossil to the creature that... Uh, that uh, it came from. Uh, when I first showed this slide, I had a more traditional picture of a Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> and then one of my former postdocs told me that Tyrannosaurus rexes were supposed to have feathers. And so he found me this. Um, and then about a month and a half later, he sent me a follow-up blog post about a recent paper that suggested that based off of some skin sample of a Tyrannosaurus rex, it actually did not have feathers. <laughs> uh, so, um, but at this point now, I've grown so fond of this weird creature thing that I, I just didn't have it in me to remove it from this. But he told me that what I should say is that this is all part of the process of making inferences and, um, and uh, how you can oftentimes get it wrong. So anyways, I've kind of grown fond of this little thing with feathers in it. But um, getting back on point, um, this kind of process is, uh, is what we'd want to follow um, when working with the Gaia data, except now what we're doing is starting from a full map of Gaia stars, taking information about the positions of the stars, their velocities, and their chemical properties, to then make the inference from this map to one where we can actually build a story about how the galaxy um, came to where it is today. So one of the really important components in this is the chemical properties of the stars. Um, so let me just take a moment to, to define this, just because I'll be using this terminology um, for the rest of the talk. So um, essentially, what I mean by chemical abundance is the amount of, um, essentially the amount of metals in the star, um, where the amount of metals is measured relative to the, um, is measured as a iron to hydrogen. Um, so if talking about those specifics is not very helpful, you can essentially just think of it as follows, that the more negative this number, the older the star is. So essentially that chemical, the chemical properties of the star are uh, one way in which you can infer something about its relative age. And one thing that's really interesting is that there's a very sharp correlation between these chemical properties and the size, the mass, of the galaxy that the star originally came from. 
Um, so this is work by um, Kirby et al. Um, and you can see, based off of the, the galaxies, dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way, that the relationship is almost linear. And what that tells you is that this is actually quite predictive, because if, if you have a sense for what the average chemical properties are of stars in a certain galaxy, you can use this to actually make a prediction for the size of the galaxy that gave you those stars. Um, so this is one of the reasons why having this information here is so powerful. It's a very important link in terms of taking something that we see about the stars today and inferring something about the halo of uh, the, the galaxy that it came from. Um, so how this all actually works in practice is essentially as follows. Um, you want to pick out the stars that are in the Milky Way that are very likely ones that were came in from these mergers. That means that you want to try to remove all of the stars that you think were born in the Milky Way's disk. That's essentially a background or a foreground for our purposes. And so you want to try to use things about the, the, the velocities of the stars and their, their chemical properties to separate out the ones that you think might belong to the disk. Um, so in general, um, if we look, for example, at chemical um, abundance versus um, rotational velocity of the stars, um, those that are in the disk are rotating <coughs> roughly at you know, 200 kilometers a second around the center of the galaxy, whereas we don't expect to see very much um, uh, any kind of coherent motion uh, for the stars that, that came in from the mergers. And similarly, if we were to look at just their overall positions in terms of distance from the disk, um, you know, obviously the disk stars will be close to the, the plane, whereas the stars that came in from the mergers will be spread out. Um, and so in this way, like looking at stars on these planes, you can try to separate out stars that you think were born in the disk versus ones that you think came in from mergers. Um, and from that, make some general conclusions about the Milky Way's um, evolution. So the results that I'm going to show for the rest of the talk focus on data in this region. So here's the sun, um, and pretty much um, you know, about two and a half kiloparsecs off the plane. So um, kind of looking broadly out here and up there. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind as I start showing some, some data plots and results in the next few slides. So after the, um, the Gaia data release in, in April, uh, there was um, a rapid succession of papers uh, that uh, immediately suggested that there are something very interesting about the stars near the solar position. And this is a result that uh, put out by Vasily Belakurov and collaborators and Amina Helmi and collaborators. And so using many of the techniques that I, that I outlined on the last few slides, what they concluded was that there's a single very large uh, merger that dumped most of the stars near, that we observed near, the, near the, the sun's position in the galaxy. So if this, for example, is a top-down view of the, the Milky Way's disk, here's the merger as it came in, and um, you know, it made several loops, and then it just got completely destroyed and just dumped uh, a large amount of stars uh, in the central parts of, of the Milky Way. Um, so this is a, an important step forward because if we now come back to our family tree, which we started from, and you know I was opening up by trying to contrast these two pictures and saying that we need a way of, of really nailing down exactly what our past history is, this result essentially pins down one of our major relatives. Um, in particular, what it tells us is that roughly seven billion years ago, our galaxy ate another galaxy. Uh, that galaxy had a stellar mass of roughly 10 to the 7 or 8 uh, solar masses. Um, and then there probably wasn't any other very significant or comparably significant merger since that point in time. Although smaller kinds of accretion events are, are continuing, and Sagittarius is probably one of the, the most important examples of that. Um, but coming back to what that means for the dark matter halo. Do, do we know which one the sun came from? Which one the? Or sun. Oh, um, well, no, that that would have been born in our that would have been born in our disk. Sounds like a good disk, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so coming back to what that means for for our dark matter halo, um, the comparison here is 
imagine that at this point in time, you know, you poured some milk into your coffee and you see it all kind of swirling around. Um, not enough time has passed until today for the system, for the milk to have gotten completely mixed in. Um, and so this, this event wasn't long enough for everything to have settled down into steady state. And indeed, um, you know, it still left behind certain structures and features um, in the dark, well, I believe that it left behind certain structures and features in the dark matter halo um, due to the fact that uh, it actually didn't happen too far ago um, in, in terms of time. So that takes me to the, the final part of my talk, which is how we can use, uh, now combine the information that we had from the simulations with the current results from Gaia to actually start saying something very concrete about the dark matter um, in the Milky Way. <clears throat> so let me start by just kind of showing you what this data looks like out of the box. Um, this is uh, the chemical properties of the stars, so the metallicity. Again, remember that this is essentially just a proxy for age, with the older stars being down here and the younger ones up here. And this is the separate velocity components. <clears throat> so by eye, um, there probably aren't very distinctive features that stick out to you. It probably just looks like amorphous blobs in each one of these panels. Um, but for our purposes, we actually need to start dividing this up into um, separate components. And the components that we're interested in are the following ones. We want to keep track of the really old stars, the ones that came in in the oldest mergers when the proto-galaxy was forming. That's going to be correlated with the really old dark matter halo. Secondly, we want to be keeping track of stars with intermediate metallicities that might have come in from younger mergers. That will be correlated with any kind of dark matter substructure. And then the final category are the, the stars that are going to be the most metal rich. Um, those, in some sense, are going to be the ones we don't care about. They are contaminating our dark matter analysis because those are the stars that were born in the disk. So there's these three categories. And we want to break up this data into those three categories. Uh, and the only way to really do that in a robust manner is to do a full likelihood analysis where you do clustering. Um, so you take every single star, you have some likelihood associated with it, and you calculate the probability that it belongs to any of those three populations. And then you try to maximize that probability over the whole population. I'm not going to go into the details of the analysis that we did. I'll just show you the final results. So um, that's the result that we get after the clustering. Um, so you can see that we have these three populations. So the green is what the analysis thinks are all of the stars that were belong to the disk. The blue is what the analysis believes are the, the stars that are in some form of substructure. And the pink are the stars that it believes came in when the proto-galaxy was forming. So they're just the, the oldest population. <coughs> Um, and there's some definite characteristics to each of these, um, which I kind of just want to go through and highlight, but it might be easier to do that um, if we instead look at the one-dimensional projection of these distributions. So here I'm just showing the radial velocity, theta velocity, and azimuthal velocity distributions, as well as the chemical um, abundance or metallicity. So the gray is the data distribution, and all of the lines are posteriors from the analysis. So let's start with the green. Um, as you can see here, the green are the set of stars that are most metal rich. So those are going to be the youngest ones. And they are rotating um, about the center of the galaxy at roughly 200 kilometers a second. So those are just the disk stars, because they're just moving in this direction. <clears throat> the second population. Um, are the really metal poor stars, the most metal poor ones. So these are the oldest ones. And if you look at their individual velocities, they look almost identical um, in terms of the overall dispersion. So it's, it's a nearly isotropic population of stars. Um, so these are the ones that we think came in from the, the really, old, really old mergers for the Milky Way. And then there's the blue dotted. Um, so these are the intermediate metallicity stars. So they're old, but not as old as the red ones. These are the ones that we believe came in with this uh, new relative that was discovered, so this new merger. Um, and one of the things that's really distinctive about it is if you look at its radial distribution, 
it actually doesn't look Gaussian. It has these kind of two peaks to it. Um, and the fact that it has two peaks um, is sort of a red flag that something interesting is going on there. Um, and actually, it's, it's a, very, a very sort of physical explanation for it. So this is just zooming in on that radial distribution. So you can see these two peaks here. Um, these are intimately linked with the properties of the satellite as it was coming in. Um, imagine as it loops in, right, it falls in and there's material being stripped off and then it loops back out and material is also stripped off. So what we're seeing here is actually stars that were stripped off as the satellite was moving in towards the center of the galaxy and then as it was orbiting back out. So this, this interesting structure there um, is actually linked in a, in a very direct way with the properties of the orbit for that satellite as it was coming in and being destroyed. The other point that I want to make here is that we've redone the analysis over a bunch of different spatial regions um, near the solar position. We don't really see any variation in any of this. So that's telling us that all of these features are, um, don't have uh, much spatial variation. And so it's, it's, it's roughly all material that is spread out um, fairly smoothly in, in space. So bringing this all together then, um, if we look at all of the stars um, that are not from our disk near the sun, with this new data from Gaia, we can now actually cleanly break them up into these two populations, one coming from the very old halo, that's about 40% of all of the stars, and then the rest in this new, from this new relative that got eaten up, um, that's in the substructure, and that's about 60% of all of the stars near us. So a very large fraction, actually the majority of the stars that are near us that aren't from the disk kind of came in with this, um, with this new relative. So now that we have this, we can actually start inferring things about the dark matter. From work with the simulations, we saw that in both of these two cases, you can actually, the dark matter traces out what the stars are doing. Um, and so we can actually just inf map these distributions directly onto the expectation for the dark matter. Um, so that tells us that, uh, it suggests that the dark matter near the solar position is actually comprised of two subsets. Um, one subset coming from um, really old mergers and another subset coming from this new, um, this new recently discovered uh, satellite that got disrupted. So you can see that that's already a modification on this sort of standard picture that um, was set out in the 1970s, well, 1980s, I guess, um, that was really modeling the dark matter near us as just being a simple isothermal gas. There's actually a lot more structure to it there, um, and that structure is starting to come into focus now because the data from, from Gaia is, is as good as, as it is. Um, the last missing component that we need in the dark matter case is actually knowing the relative fraction of these two pieces. Um, <clears throat> We can't actually just take the 40 and the 60% here. We need to actually um, make some guesses about the amount of dark matter that was brought in in each of these cases. Um, the reason for all of this is that in the eyes of dark matter, um, you know, two galaxies aren't necessarily going to be equivalent if they have the same amount of stars in them. Um, or said another way, an old merger uh, that, has, uh, that is dark matter dominated uh, will tend to be more dark matter dominated than a younger merger, um, which will tend to have um, more stars in it and comparably less dark matter. So that means that we need to be able to make some guesses as to the relative amounts of dark matter that were brought in from these really old mergers in the Milky Way compared to this new, um, um, this new galaxy that came in about seven billion years ago. So uh, this is something that we are, we are finalizing um, we, we've been modeling it by trying to estimate things about the mass to light ratio. Happy to talk about that offline, but essentially the bottom line here is that um, we think that this new merger brought in about 25% less, less dark matter um, than the really old halo mergers. And once we know that number, that's essentially the last piece we need because it tells us what the relative fractions are here. And once we have those relative fractions, we essentially have a map or a model of what the dark matter is um, near, the, near the position of the sun in the Milky Way. So with that model, we can come back to the original, um, 
the original question uh, posed by you know, direct detection experiments, which are out trying to, to look for these dark matter particles. Um, these are, as I said earlier, going to depend on the, the local properties of the dark matter halo. We now know how to build up that halo from um, data from Gaia. So uh, we can actually go back and uh, use the new measurements of the dark matter speed distribution to make inferences for the observable properties of these experiments. So in particular, um, most of these experiments are looking for the rates of these recoils as a function of the energy of the nucleus. So that's what I'm showing here. So this is just the recoil energy of the nucleus as a function of, uh, sorry, the rate as a function of energy. Um, so I'm gonna just um, get this movie going, but let me just explain what you're gonna see. So on this panel is the velocity distribution that we think is associated with the really old dark matter. That's the red dash. The blue dotted is the velocity distribution of the dark matter we think is coming in from um, this, recent, uh, this recent merger. And when I get the movie going, their relative ratios are going to change. Um, and it'll show you how that ends up impacting the prediction for the experiments. <clears throat> so as that ratio changes, the prediction here sort of sweeps out a band. And it actually turns out you're not hugely sensitive. Um, it's, it's sort of a small band here that gets, that gets swept out. As a point of comparison, the sort of standard model that's been used, um, the isothermal model, that's shown in dashed gray on both of these. So in general, what the new results seem to suggest is that there's fewer high-speed dark matter particles um, than would have been expected with the, um, the standard isothermal isothermal model. Um, these updates to the speed distribution also affect things like the time dependence of the signal in, um, in these experiments, so that's just shown here. In general, there are certain classes of um, models where these uh, new results will have a larger impact. Um, it tends to be, you know, where you'll see larger differences is if you're making predictions for light dark matter candidates, um, if you have momentum dependent scattering operators or if you're looking for directional signatures. Um, because now with this kind of model, the dark matter is no longer isotropic. It actually has some interesting directional behavior. Um, so with that, let me conclude. Um, and I want to do that by kind of coming back to where we started, uh, which was you know, from the initial piece of evidence from which the, um, we've built a model of the dark matter halo, right, rotation curves. Um, and sort of the standard story was you start from a rotation curve, you assume that the halo, the Milky Way history, is very quiet, and that the, the dark matter is in steady state, and that gives you um, a very predictive model for, for the dark matter distribution. Um, interestingly, um, our galaxy's history is much more interesting than that. And so with new data from Gaia, um, there's now evidence that there was a significant merger that dumped a lot of material near where the sun is about seven giga years ago. Um, that merger left a lot of substructure and features in the stars. And um, once we characterize this and combine this with results from simulations that suggest that the dark matter in the star should be acting in a very similar way, that lets us build dark matter maps and then make predictions for, um, the, uh, the ex for dark matter um, experiments. So I've called this the, the HALO version 2.0 because our job isn't done yet. Um, and uh, the big open question that I think is the one next one we need to address is as follows. Um, our goal is to really characterize all of the dark matter near the sun. Um, what I've told you is what comes, this dark matter that comes from satellites that had stars in them. And already we've been able to make a lot of headway here because we've been able to see that this is actually very interesting. There's a very old population and one that's in substructure. But what I can't tell you is if there's a large fraction that's also coming from galaxies that had no stars in them. And so our next task is to try to characterize this component and actually say whether or not it's going to be a significant or a neg negligible contribution to, the, um, to local dark matter density. Um, so with that, I'll conclude and I'm happy to take any additional questions. Thank you. Uh,
question, how do you distinguish minor mergers from significant mergers? <clears throat> you mean in terms of what the terminology I was using in the talk? Yeah. Um, oh, okay, so, well, a, a major merger would be one that, when it came in, significantly actually significantly altered the gravitational potential of our galaxy. So the mass of the merger should be comparable? Roughly, yeah. yeah. So the, what I, the, the new merger in the tree was, would not be a major merger, but it was still fairly significant because it left a lot of material uh, near, nearby. Um, so in that way, and then also based off of like its relative mass, you could see that it, it was still fairly significant. <clears throat> Everything else since then will have been more minor because it just didn't dump as much stuff. So it's not only the mass, so? Yeah, it would be both. It would be it's just several things kind of going into that. Uh, so for the substructure velocity plus that you showed, like all of the r, z, and phi five velocities are centered at zero. So is that uh, is this like consistent with the galaxy coming in in simulations? Like it has a zero, almost zero radial tangential velocity. <coughs> uh, which sorry, which line in are you talking about? Uh, this one? No, this one. Yeah, yeah. All of the substructure plots are centered at zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this actually comes back to what we were talking about in the session earlier, uh, right? Because um, when you asked whether or not there was any net rotation or evidence for net rotation the in the dark matter halo, so you can see here that each of these components is actually centered at zero, so it doesn't, or especially this one mm -hmm. here, so it doesn't look like there's any rotation to the. Even for <coughs> the substructure which came in. Yeah, in the yeah, okay. yeah. It didn't have to be the case. So in simulations, we see substructure that leaves all sorts of interesting things, and sometimes it uh, actually is rotating. Mm -hmm. The it just turns out that this particular thing was on a really radial orbit. Not that uh, other stars have used lots of their hydrogen to form heavier metals, so <coughs> how come the other stars uh, have a lower iron to hydrogen ratio? Um, good, yeah. So um, it's because, so imagine we have some, uh, some galaxies some formed at early times, um, and the gas in that galaxy is going to be enriched by supernova explosions. Um, and so in the uh, early period, sort of, it's, it's primarily going to be dominated by core collapse supernova, which inject things like alpha elements um, and not as much metals into the, into the system. So once that galaxy comes in and starts getting tidally disrupted by the Milky Way, that actually shuts off the star formation. Um, so what we end up seeing are the stars that, that were formed in the really early stages for that galaxy. In comparison, if we had a galaxy that formed early on, um, but that didn't get eaten up by the Milky Way for some time, um, what ends up happening is its gas gets enriched by thermonuclear supernova. That injects more iron into it. So when that galaxy comes in and gets eaten up, um, it will be contributing stars that are, will in general be more metal rich. So we'll have more iron in them. But I think part of that question was about the surface abundances. Yeah. <clears throat> that the surface abundances are more or less constant for stars, even though internally they're generating tons of heavier metals. Oh, okay. He was just saying that the interior of the old stars has converted into a lot of metals, but this, that's not what you see. Right, okay. right. That's still hidden underneath the ionosphere, which is more or less conservative. Is there a way to quantify how good of a tracer these metal poor stars are to the dark matter distribution? Like you showed the curves overlap, but, but is it 10% or 5%? <coughs> um, yeah, so um, we're finishing up some work now where we go into the fire simulation and essentially pull out um, satellite galaxies on orbits that look like they're similar to what we're finding in the Gaia data. and. Um, look at where their stars and dark matter end up today and then do a detailed quantitative comparison. Um, and for the deviations are sort of less than 10% for most of the velocity range. And then you tend to get maybe, you can get up to like 50% variations kind of in the last velocity bits, but then that's where you're kind of statistics limited. But it, it seems to be um, consistently uh, quite, quite good over most of the range. Um, the, one of the reasons why we think that 
correspondence is happening is that by the time that these galaxies have actually gotten down to where the solar position is, most of their outer dark matter halo has gotten eaten away. And so what's getting removed are both the dark matter and stars that are most bound near the center of that galaxy. So they, they're both kind of bound to the galaxy with roughly the same energy. One last question from Masha. Uh, so kind of following up on that, you showed the uncertainty um, in the dark matter, you know, the experimental relevant parameter, which is the velocity. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a very thin band. So can you say again what, um, yeah, what that uncertainty <coughs> comes from and if the, these things like the, the dark matter and stars tracing each other, if that's a, already included in that <coughs> or is that meant? Um, no, so um, where that uncertainty band is coming from is in the prediction of the relative amounts of dark matter we expect to be in this population versus this other one. Um, and the uncertainty is coming from our ability to essentially predict the mass to light ratio of those satellites. So there's several different relations that we take, um, several different models that we take um, that feed into that. Um, and each one of those has like a set of uncertainties on there parameters and so it, it sort of propagates over. So this is this band here is an uncertainty on um, how well we know the amount of dark matter that was associated with each of those mergers. So do you expect it sorry, just to follow up, do you expect it to get wider if you include the kinds of uncertainties like whether the stars in the dark matter are perfectly tracing each other or do you expect it to Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, yes, because there's no way to really be able to quantify that exactly. So yeah, that's just like a systematic uncertainty that's, that's just present by assumption. Yeah. And, and you'd expect that systematic uncertainty to be quite large, for example, the dark matter self-interacting, or maybe if it's fuzzy, then the collisionless hypothesis could fail, um, the inferences we're making from the simulations could fail, and then um, it isn't clear to me whether or not you would necessarily expect to get the same correlations. very uh, ignorant question from somebody completely outside this field, so forgive me. Uh, you want to analyze this experiment of the distribution of the coiling nuclei, mm -hmm. so you have to assume something about uh, the cross-section of the dark matter with the nuclei. Mm -hmm. Presumably, you're not talking about gravitational cross-section. Right. You yes. are? No, 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 no. You're yeah, I else. meant to say that what you said was correct. Okay. Yes. If that is correct, then uh, I... I'm a little, a little confused about the simulation where you, where you found identical distribution in all the velocity <coughs> components of dark matter and uh, other matter, which those models did not have any information on, on that. I mean, that's a very unknown quantity, I imagine, the, the interaction yeah. of dark matter with ordinary matter. So the so and, and that was not in the, in those models. No, and so actually, the, how do the I use those models for the analyzing the experiment you're interested in? The the simulations themselves actually don't even have the resolution to to identify individual dark matter particles. Mm -hmm. So a particle in the simulation is about ten to the four dark matter clumped together. That's about as mm -hmm. as good as they can do in terms of resolving it. So they're really just looking at the gravitational interactions of these large blobs of, of dark matter, and then tr trying to see how those um, uh, those blobs sort of how they orbit and, and fall and, and get distributed in the galaxy as it gets built up. So um, what we can draw from the simulations is information. Like there's a limited amount of things we can draw from the simulations. I think one of the things that's reasonably robust is something about general characteristics about um, orbital, like these orbital trajectories, and, and whether or not we expect the stars and the dark matter to kind of be following each other. It doesn't tell us anything, though, about the sort of microscopic physics of the dark matter, because that's not even probed on the scales of what the simulation can get. So at. how does one propose to analyze the, the distribution of the recoiling nuclei if one has yeah, so that the, the ultimate question, how does the dark matter interact with the um, there is That's matter. an assumption. So I glossed over it, but essentially when making this, you have to make some assumption about what that <coughs> interaction is. And if you wanted me, like I could have made a bunch of these for different sets of interactions. And, uh, and yeah. that, that would have to be a very, very small interaction because it, it would have to be outside the standard model. So it's got one over the 
Yeah, yeah it's going to be a very, it's gonna, yeah, weak scale interaction cross section. So with that uh, interesting direction, I think that we will carry our questions downstairs today to the, is that correct, to the eighth floor over uh, by the, the glass staircase, and we can uh, thank our speaker again.